Hey everyone, Mr. Canistero here. In today's videos, we're going to talk about reflection and refraction. So uh, by the end of the video, you should be able to define both reflection and refraction, as well as do some calculations with it and kind of discuss these two properties of light. So where we have to start with these concepts is light itself. And we define that the speed of light in vacuum is defined to be C equals 299,792,458,000,000. 458 meters per second in a vacuum. Oftentimes we just round that off and say C equals three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. The important fact though is in other materials, light such as water, oil, etc., light travels at a slower speed. So our first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna define what's called the index of refraction, uh, which we're gonna use the letter N for index of refraction as the ratio of the speed of light through said material divided by the speed of light in vacuum. Or written as an equation, if we say the speed of light in vacuum is the letter C, and the speed of light through any material, we just call it V as, as in velocity, we define N as simply C divided by V. And so note that every index of refraction is some number greater than one, because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Good. So now that we know uh, this one basic fact, that light travels slower in any material other than a vacuum, we can jump into reflection and refraction. So where this all begins is with, with our old math buddy, uh, Fermat, and Fermat's theorem or principle of least time. And so the principle of least time goes like this. The path taken between two points by a ray of light is the path that can be traversed in the least possible amount of time. So understanding this just basic principle is gonna help us explain reflection and refraction. We're actually gonna start with refraction first and then jump to reflection. So imagine the following. Imagine we start with some source of light visualized by this green circle up here, and we want the light to exit at this green X down at the bottom. It's gonna from, go from air to water, then back to air. And the black, red, and blue X's represent three possible paths. So I'll go ahead and draw those up. Here is path one. Label that path one. Here is path two. And then finally, here is path three. So one of those takes the least possible amount of time and therefore, and is the path that light will actually take. Let's go through them one by one. Well, choice one spends a very small amount of time in the air and then spends a significant amount of time in water. And since we already said that light slows down in water, this path is going to take a long amount of time because most of the, of the time spent is in water when light's traveling slow. So path one, eh, not quite. How about path three? Well, path three is nice because it's spending a lot of time in the air, but it's also traveling a very large distance. And so even though most of the time is spent in the air, the extra distance also results in more time. And so the actual answer, uh, the path the light takes, is a path somewhat close to path two, where it travels some path in the air, then it bends inwards to try to shorten the distance in water because it wants to spend as least amount of time in water as possible so that it can get uh, from, to, from one point to another point as quickly as possible. So this phenomenon, the bending of light when it goes from one material to another, is what we're going to call refraction. And so um, as a general phenomenon, whenever light passes from one material to another material, it will bend um, either inwards or it'll bend out depending on the two materials it's going from. So here's the rules for how it works. If the surface that you're entering has a higher index of refraction, light's going to bend towards the normal. And just a little quick uh, reference. Remember, the normal is that perpendicular line we make to the surface, and that's what we measure all our angles to in this, in this class. And so that should make sense because if you have a higher index of refraction, light's going to travel very slow, so it's going to want to go as vertical as possible through the material to try to minimize the amount of time in the material. Now, if the surface has a lower index of refraction that it's going into, light's going to bend away from normal. Again, because it's able to, tr to spend more time in that material, or uh, well, I'm sorry, it's able to travel a further distance that, in that material in the same amount of time because it's traveling faster. So as a picture, if you want to visualize this, um, consider the following, where you have two materials, uh, N1 and N2. Um, the light enters at some angle theta 1, and it's going to bend to some new angle theta 2 in the case that 
uh, the second material has a higher index for fraction than the first material. A couple other things that are going to happen. In this case, we're dealing with air and glass. The light is going to slow down its speed in glass. Also, the wavelength is going to change as well. Uh, the one thing that doesn't change, the one property of a light that never changes when it goes from one material to another is the frequency, if it's a certain, if it's like a monochromatic beam of light. Um, really always think of the frequency as like the signature of the wave. That's the one thing that kind of never changes, no matter where it goes from one material to another. So one thing we might want to know is, how can we relate the two index indices or fraction with the two angles? And thankfully, we actually have an equation for doing so. And that equation is called Snell's Law. It goes like this. The product of the first index of refraction times the sine of the first angle coming in equals the product of the second index of refraction times the sine of the angle going into the second material. Um, pretty simple equation used for calculating um, angles and different indices of refraction. Just please remember, all of our angles, again, are referenced in, to the normal. So if there's some surface that we have, the normal, again, is that perpendicular line formed between the two between the surfaces. And the angle is always measured between the ray of light and that normal. So let's go ahead and get our feet wet and let's try a little simple question. Imagine a beam of red light uh, that enters water, which has an index refraction of 1.33, with an, I'm sorry, yeah, it enters water from air with an angle of 30 degrees. What angle will it have in the water? So we already know because air has an index, is defined to have an index of refraction of approximately one, because we're going to assume air is basically a vacuum, and water has an index of refraction of 1.33, we know that it's going to bend inwards. So it's going to be definitely a smaller angle. So let's go ahead and calculate this. First, we're going to write down Snell's law just to have it next to us. And that, again, is m1 sine theta 1, the product of the first two in indices the index of refraction and the angle uh, coming in equals n2, the second index refraction, times the sine of the second angle, which is what we're trying to solve for. I simply plug in my variables. My n1 is 1.0, the index refraction of air. Um, sine of 30 degrees, my initial angle, equals n2, which is 1.33, times the sine of the angle 2. Now it's just a matter of typing in and getting some math. Well, sine of 30 is 1 half, so 1 half times 1, we get 0.5 on this side, equals 1.33 sine theta 2. Sorry, I got to write sine. Uh, dividing over, we get sine theta 2 equals 0 0.38 approximately, just doing some rounding. So that means theta 2 is the inverse sine of 0.38, which comes out to be approximately 22 degrees. And so we already predicted that it would be a smaller angle going in the water, and now we know for sure that this angle is smaller, and it is in fact 22 degrees. Awesome. So there's refraction uh, definition and a quick, simple calculation. Now let's go ahead and finish up, and we'll jump. We'll talk about reflection. So you know reflection is when light bounces off the surface. Um, let's go ahead and figure out how we can predict how light will bounce off the surface. And again, we're going to use Fermat's principle this time. So quickly, we'll jump up to that again, just as a refresher. Sorry about the sliding up. Remember, Fermat's principle this time is the path taken between two points by a ray of light is the path that can be traversed in the least possible amount of time. So let's go run, run back down and take a look at that. So envision two points, A and B, and we have a ray of light that's going to bounce off this surface and wants to get to B. Well, what are the things that can happen? First off, it's going to take this angle, we'll say theta 1. And so what are the things that it could possibly do? Well, instead of taking this original angle, maybe if it took a steeper angle, like this, then it'd have to go like that to get the B. And again, if you're looking at distances here, uh, notice that's kind of a, a large distance. Instead, let's try something else. Envision B like this, as being simply on the exact other side, because we know the shortest distance between two points in Euclidean space is a straight line. So if, this, if there wasn't a barrier here, we know the shortest distance between these two points, again, is a straight line. That's the path the light would travel. Well, if we draw our normal, and we call this our first angle, theta 1, and this one our second angle, theta 2, 
We know because these are vertical angles, they have to be the exact same thing. So if, they, if, there was, if light were traveling in simply a straight line, those two angles would be the same, and that would represent the shortest possible distance. But since B is up here, the light has to reflect. And so the path that it's going to take is going to be the exact same angle as below here, and therefore it'll be the same angle altogether. And so really using Fermat's principle of least time, we can say the following, that whatever the incident angle is, which I call theta i, is going to be the exact same angle as the reflected angle. And that is the law of reflection. So uh, that's today's video on reflection and refraction. Hope to help you guys out. Uh, lots more to come. Have an awesome evening. See ya. Oop, got to close it off. All right, have a good night.